All right, well, we might as well start. Um, uh, so for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Duncan Carson. I'm the Projects and Business Manager um, at the Independent Cinema Office. And one of those projects is uh, working on Film Hub Southeast, um, which is a great pleasure um, because uh, this, this is my uh, home territories. I'm originally from uh, Maine, which is near um, March, which is near Ely, if you don't know. <laughs> Um, so if you're not from Cambridge, uh, often I've taught, when I've toured around people, people, I say, oh, I'm actually from here. Oh, whereabouts? Maine, and they're like, never heard of it. Um, so uh, yeah, so I, 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 I know I know of what I speak. So um, hopefully I um, can bring in some local insights today. Um, particularly because what we're talking about is um, something that uh, takes us away from the local um, experience and brings us into potentially the global experience. Um, and that is online screening platforms for beginners. Um, just to quickly start off by describing myself for anyone on the call who's visually impaired. Um, I'm a white man in my thirties um, with uh, brown hair and I'm against a uh, white background. Um, so I'm gonna, the, just to talk about how the session will run today, um, I'm really glad to be joined for, uh, by um, reps from uh, Film Bank Media and I'll ask them to introduce um, themselves when uh, uh, we come to them. They've set up a great new streaming platform during uh, this period, which I think is gonna be a real boon if you're looking into uh, doing online, online screenings. Um, and I'm also, we're also gonna be hearing from uh, my former colleague, um, now good friend, um, Ellen Ray, who's the uh, marketing manager at the Queen's Film Theatre in Belfast. Um, they've taken, uh, they, a few, prior to the pandemic even, um, with, with great foresight, they set up their own streaming, streaming platform, the QFT player. Um, so we're gonna be hearing from them about how they, um, how they set that up and, and what the benefits are if you're considering going down that route yourself. Um, I should say for anyone who needs captions, um, you, you can access them via the link that uh, my colleague Sammy has shared in the chat. If you're having any problems um, in general, um, just drop questions into the chat and um, we'll, we'll move as fast as we can to resolve them. Um, okay, so with all, that, with all that out of the way, um, we can now crack on with um, presentation. And I'm, gonna be talk I'm gonna be talking a little bit about um, some general ideas about um, setting your own online screenings up, um, and then we'll move into two great, uh, um, along the path, we'll, we'll move into two presentations from uh, uh, the presenters we'll, um, I'll just introduce. Okay, so, um, oops, just bear with me. Um, okay, so where are we now? Um, it's important to like have a bit of a take on, you know, if you're assessing the value of these, of, of setting up an online streaming platform or, or starting to do online streamings yourself, um the it's important to understand the general landscape because that will help you assess whether you think this is something that we've got to grasp with both hands or something that you think maybe we'll uh keep monitoring the situation see what see what happens um so as as you might have guessed uh or might you might know already compared to the robust data that the exhibition industry generally collects um, online streaming uh, is a much, uh, or VOD in general, is a much murkier area of, um, of data. So because so much data is owned proprietarily by, all, by organizations like Netflix, um, you know, um, slightly better on the, um, um, the iPlayer, but generally these organizations jealously guard the information around, their, around how many people are engaging with their platform. Um, partly um, mainly because they, they don't have to disclose that information and partly because shareholders um, get anxious when they see results that are less than stellar. Um, so for all kinds of reasons, it's harder to say, you know, like this is what's happening and this is the general picture, but there's a few general things that are relevant to um, our project that we can say. Um, there's definitely been an increase in art house streaming um, over the last year or so. You know, we've seen this sort of growth of platforms like um, Mubi, BFI Player, um, those kind of those kind of, and Curzon Home Cinema. Um, those places have definitely grown in the last. You know, like even some reporting kind of like um, several times growth across previous weekends, non-pandemic weekends, in previous years. Um, but alongside that, there's been an explosion of digital choice and digital screening. So, you know, as much as some people are finding their feet, there's also just so much more content and availability out there than there's ever been before. Um, all organizations that are already um, in the blocks 
happened quite far ahead have like invested only more um and organ and plenty of new organizations have joined the fray as well so it's definitely a much broader marketplace out there but on the other hand as much as it's much more competitive there's also a much broader swathe of uh of customers that you can rely on um because like lots of people have cleared the digital hurdles uh, you know i'm sure i'm sure there's people uh, you know i have certainly have found myself having conversations with my my mum and dad more about things that they watched on netflix in a way that they you know uh, they asked me what if i've seen the dig in a way that they wouldn't have done a year ago so that's that's definitely a, a major you know like speaking moving taking it away from the anecdotal um in 2020 um 12 million adults were added to like signed up for streaming services in fact just in april alone 12 million people had joined streaming services and 3 million of those people who had never subscribed to any streaming platform before so you can tell that you know whether uh like whether they, these people retain using these services or afterwards um there's definitely been a, a growth in this area so there's an opportunity as well um, audience is definitely still keen to return to the cinema. We, you know, there's like as much as you'll see in the Indigo Limited um, presentation uh, tomorrow, I believe, um, that the, the definitely this is one of the sort of worst times for people feeling confident to return to cinemas. People are there's still a good, a healthy amount of people who want to go back to cinema, so it's definitely not. They've got, you know, like there's sometimes a, a map people imagine that once they get hooked on streaming, they never want to come out of the house again. But I think it's fair to say that most people on this call you know debunk, uh, are happy to debunk that idea um and of people who have already um, engaged with digital culture and now that's across all types of digital culture like so could be dance could be you know live theater streaming um 23 uh, percent of those will def have said that they definitely will continue to engage even after the in-person alternative is available so that's that shows you what the kind of potential uh, audience base is if you're thinking how long what's the how long term an investment am i making in this there's 23 percent of people who are going to you know if you can find data about how many people in your area are looking at streaming already you can sort of set you can make some sort of rough estimates about whether it's something you want to think about just for the meantime or for long term um, and, you know, one of the things that's quite exciting is there's been a lot more collaboration between exhibitors and distributors and people because the, this is such a sort of nascent area. Um, people are doing a lot more work to um, collaborate in a way that sort of breaks through some of the um, slightly more uh, antagonistic um, relationships that we sometimes find across those two groups. So I hope that gives you an overview of, of, of like the, the, the world we're looking at right now. Um, I probably, you know, have bolstered this a little bit um, by saying that, you know, I, I think uh, people's perspectives on this might have changed um, over, even over the last couple of days. But I think it's important to think about whether this is something you want to invest in long term um, and what and how it fits within a potential, you know, hybrid program. So less less a kind of like it's the only thing we can do at the moment and more a kind of how can we extend our work? So. The other thing that I tend to find is that the um, people amass these different, very disparate um, approaches to showing films online into one um, uh, one sort of sense of approach. Um, so I think it's worth just unpicking some of those terms so that people understand what we're talking about. So what do we talk about when we talk about virtual? So I'm going to take you through each of these terms, VOD, affiliate cinemas, owned VOD, streaming, SVOD sometimes called, and virtual screenings. And um, the people who I've got on this call um, represent at least two of those, um, those models. So, okay, VOD. In a sense, it's the easiest, VOD, i.e. video on demand, is probably the easiest kind of model for people to um, understand conceptually because it ex that extracts something from the analog world like disc or even going back uh, a little bit further VHS rental so they understand how it works you get it for a certain amount of time um, and then um, and then uh, you get a limited window to watch um, I mean obviously you can buy these titles as well with some DRM restrictions which I'll talk about later but yeah it's um, it's generally sort of something people understand, but it's also, and so the, there's a familiarity there, but on the other hand, it's not the most used platform by people um, uh, using, like watching video online of any kind. So uh, yeah, so it's, 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 it's a very well established model and it's probably the, the earliest thing, that, um, earliest widely adopted model of, of, of sharing films in digital distribution. Um, 
now something that you, some of you uh, will um, have, have taken part in is the affiliate cinema model. It's potential, you know, has a lot of potential um, to to be used by groups even outside cinemas. But basically, um, the distributor owns the platform, um, so you don't have to make any investments into technology really, or much the barrier to entry is much lower. Um, and then the cinema but gets a cut. And then fundamentally, it's a model where the cinema but, or any other type of group becomes a promoter um, rather than um, a, you know as much as rather than a facilities um, uh, manager. Um, so you're you're basically trying to see how much you can um, leverage your um, marketing to deliver audiences for the distributor, and you get a cut of of any money that they get through um, through sales through your site. Um, and it's one quite interesting because uh, it broadens out who potentially could be an exhibitor, like what it, what we might have sort of thought of as um, partnerships, um, you know, like you might do an event um, with a local um, South Asian group um, and they could, pretend, uh, you know, a screening in venue with a South Asian group to attract um, uh uh, audiences for a Bollywood film, now that South Asian group could potentially become an affiliate themselves and try and reach their audience directly um, because there's much less, in, like the, the sort of, they don't need to have a DCP projector and all those things that, that there's the distributor is basically providing the facilities to view. So some interesting opportunities there for both cinemas and groups outside cinema to get involved in, you know, in helping films reach audiences. Um, own VOD is really more of a sort of subset of the VOD model where, um, and I, I won't go to, in too much depth here because um, you'll get a much clearer picture from what Ellen has to tell us about QFT player. Um, the cinema owns its own VOD platform. So normally it, rather than doing all of the tech development, it tends to be a white label version of a, um, an established platform. Um, and that then, you know, it's made specific. So the user experience is that, you know, this is an owned space. Um, and the, the, the value of this is um, that you can do a lot of the thing, you know, it, it becomes much more like a, a, new, a new screen you've added to your cinema. So, you, it, you know, requires all of that traditional work of audience development, thinking about programming and marketing that proposition, um, but on in, in a new digital space. Now, obviously, the downside uh, of having all that data and that, you know, that very clear um, platform is that there's a higher, higher barrier to entry um, to take part. Now, um, then uh, streaming, uh, which is by far and away the um, uh, biggest space where people are watching um, uh, video online outside of free platforms like YouTube, um, which is arguably a streaming platform. Um, you can see here my, uh, this is, I, I just quickly cribbed from my list. I've yet to, I, I know that To All The Boys part three is dropped, but I've yet to catch up on part two. Um, so uh, <laughs> there's, uh, so just to sort of, you know, like obviously it's things like Netflix, iPlayer, Amazon Prime, like those, you know, those, you know, like maybe not necessarily in that order, but those are the platforms that have the biggest share in the UK. People like it because, um, the, you know, once there, there's, there's much fewer lower barrier to entry. It feels like free, um, you know, even though obviously you, you pay a subscription every month in most cases or, you know, or pay the license fee. So there's, there's already been, a, you know, a, a cost reductive, but, you know, people aren't making individual choices about transactions. Um, but, you know, it's, it's all you can eat once you're inside. Um, and, you know, the, 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 the thing is, um, audiences are very familiar with this model and like more or less, anytime you're introducing a different model, people say, oh, why isn't it like Netflix? Why is this not like Amazon Prime? So you, it, it, and, and ultimately you need to think about your offer uh, uh, alongside those um, in the same way that um, if you are opening a new cinema or considering your current option, you'd think about what's the multiplex down the road doing and what's the experience there. You need if you're opening up a VOD offer, this is what you're sort of arguing people take their eyeballs off to, to join your offer. So obviously, you know, there's there's it's it's be very hard to compete on ease of use and and range of catalog, but there are other there are other ways you can leverage people's interest than um than just having you know than having a slick um massively tech supported um uh uh Silicon Valley um, platform. So 
just to finish off, because this, this leads very seamlessly, um, as though I'd planned it, into uh, Filmbank's presentation, um, the idea, the overall kind of like model of doing a virtual screening, which for independent cinemas um, is a really potentially a very um, appealing one, because again, it, it replicates something that people are very used to from um, from their experience of, of visiting cinemas, which is that it's a time screening at a particular time, a uh, particular moment. Um, so, you know, you can, you, you get that sort of um, urgency that isn't there perhaps with a VOD or streaming model. Um, and then after you've activated the, you know, once the, the window opens to watch that film, there's a limited time after that to watch. Um, and for, you know, it, it is something that people, uh, you know, tend to, we, that I'm Ellen, I'm sure we'll talk about this later, but, uh, it, and, and film bank, but there is a value to having something that's, um, has urgency and novelty in it. Like, what do I need to do right now? So I'm very happy to hand over to, uh, film bank now. Um, they're going to talk about their, their platform that, that they've built up, they've very impressively built up over the last year or so. Sorry, I've got to put myself on, on mute. Um, to share my screen. Okay, does that work? Right, okay, so I'm Rapinda, I'm Head of Sales at Filmbank Media, and I'm here to talk to you about Virtual Screening Room, or VSR as we like to call it. So Virtual Screening Room is a digital service which allows streaming of films anywhere in the UK with a good internet connection through a PC or Mac. Now, we didn't want to just offer a standard streaming service. We wanted to find a way to try and inject a community feel. So to go in some way to create that, we've built a chat window where members can log in up to two hours before the film and catch up. They can also uh, chat during the film if they want to using a second device through a phone or a tablet. And of course, after the film, because the chat uh, is actually open uh, up to 24 hours after the film finishes. That's if you want to chat for that long. Uh, screenings can be at home, in a venue or both. So when lockdown does ease and people do start going back to venues, you could have a hybrid screening where you'd have members in a physical venue. And for those who can't leave the house for various reasons can join virtually. So this sort of uh, increases your reach and opens up your, uh, your reach to your audience, essentially. The service allows you to control the date and time you want to screen your films and in effect becomes your personalised room where you can have your organisation's name appear in the screening room. So when members do enter, they know they're in the right place and it starts to create that sense of community before they start chatting. Crucially, it brings a title to a single accessible place where an audience can come together knowing that their fellow members are having the same experience. So VSI is predominantly an indie focused service and this was really clear because of a survey we carried out with Cinema for All, uh, which showed that there was a strong requirement for indie content. And this is also confirmed because we looked at our own historic bookings from our own customers and that really shaped the type of content we put on the service. But we do acknowledge that there is a need for mainstream films and we are in talks with other producers and distributors for their content and more titles will be added on a regular basis uh, but the aim is to build a very catalogue of strong films with an indie focus. Uh, so VSR launched on the 18th of January with an especially curated selection of indie titles from various distributors and producers, including Pathé, Modern Films and Peccadillo, just to name a few. But if you'd like to see a whole list of titles available, please do go onto our website under the VSR page. So in amongst the launch titles, we have two key films in Falling from three-time Oscar-nominated actor Viggo Mortensen. So this film released in December and Modern Films were really kind enough to let us have this title for our launch. Uh, the second title was Schemers, winner of the Audience Award at the Edinburgh International Film Festival. We had this title on a one-week exclusive ahead of its digital release on the and what we found at launch was the, the, the producers and the distributors who were on board at the time were really keen to be part of this service at launch and also really keen to see how this service uh, establishes itself in the market. 
Content wise, we will have monthly themes. So for our focus for February is LGBTQ plus history month. And we have a selection of great titles ranging from the documentary 50 Years Legal to the cinematic groundbreaker Tangerine. Monsoon featuring a standout performance from Henry Golding heads up our selection of independent films on offer for this month. Other titles include Sauvage, 1985, Pain and Glory and The Feel Good Pride. Future content coming up include Miss Juneteenth, which premiered in the US on Emancipation Day and released in the UK last year in September. We're also really pleased to have a selection of titles from Thunderbird releasing who we've just onboarded. And their titles include the Palm Door winning Shoplifters, the Critically Lauded Burning and the Beautiful Rita and Virginia. So what to expect? Once you've uh, selected your films and you've booked with us, we will send you a URL link and a list of login credentials for you to send on to your members three working days before the screening. On the screening day, we do encourage that you ask your members to, um, to test their setup and make use of that two hour window before the film starts. And it's also a really good opportunity to, to get in there and start having a good old chat before the, the film starts. Your audience can select different language subtitles or dubs where available, and that would enhance their own experience in, in the screening. The film has a synchronized start, so they will it will play automatically at the specified time uh, the, the film was booked. So there's no need to play it, start, press the play button or anything like that. Technical requirements, as I mentioned earlier, you'll need a laptop or a PC with Windows or a Mac operating system to screen the film. Tablets, phones and other devices like games consoles are not supported for the video. However, the chat window is available on a tablet or phone as well as your PC and laptop. Browser wise, we'd recommend Chrome, although Microsoft Edge, Safari and Firefox work just as well. The only browser we'd say um, don't use because it's not supported is Internet Explorer. An internet connection of over five megabits is fine, but we would recommend a speed of over 10 megabits a second. Mirroring and casting is not supported, unfortunately, and this is down to security reasons with our partners. So pricing wise, we're really mindful of how sensitive uh, license fees can be. So there will be no change to our standard rate card for indoor screenings. So for a non-commercial or non-ticketed screening, uh, pricing would start from a flat fee of £83. For commercial or a ticketed screening, the MG would start from £83 or 35% of your box office, whichever is the greater amount. Uh, there is a small streaming fee, so, and that starts from £2.50 uh, per 10 audience members, and we sell these in box of 10. So just to give you a worked example, if you have an audience size of 35, uh, your license fee is going to be 83 your stream fee is 10 pounds and that's because you'll need four books to cover your your 35 members and then if you add your vouch you get your total if you'd like some more information on vsr or um, open up an account with us please do get in touch and we'd be really happy to help thank you thanks so much repinda that's great um i should have said at the top of the call um, if people want to drop in questions to the chat um we can cover those at the end of the call um, so please do just keep um, adding in anything that um, you know people want to cover, and we'll we'll, we'll get to that at the end. So I can already see there's some some good questions being added um, that I can fill out later. Um, so I just would just just before we move on, I'd um, just be interested to know what kind of um, early results you've seen, Rapinda, on uh, from from from, from take up already. Have people been has it have there been some good successes so far? Yeah, from launch, um, our customers alone were really pleased to see the service launch. Um, we've had quite a, an uptake and it has been increasing uh, as we establish and people start to understand what the service is and what the process is. So in effect, what we try to do is, is make it as simple as possible for our customers to access this service. So there's no change to the way that they would process their bookings with us. It was just more about getting to know a digital service that you know you know with the audience you know they can be quite reticent um so it's it was just about just talking through that but the uptake has increased and we're doing really well actually is there anyone you know for people out here i'm sure like generally whenever i've been asked to um show off our digital services they often sort of say like oh is there anyone example that you could point to is there anyone in you know in your kind of state who's who's doing it 
uh, in a way that that is comparable, who they people could check out? Um, I don't know. Um, I would say maybe your screen, but I think with us, we can't. We haven't seen anyone who offers a chat facility. Oh, sorry, sorry. I was going to say reprint. I just meant. I meant like actual film societies who are doing who are doing it. Um, who have like got this? Who are using the service and selling? Oh, them. sorry. Uh, sorry. Oh, I was, sorry. Maybe it wasn't right. very clear. No, no, no. Just, just any. If there's any sort of um, groups who are currently, um, you know, using the service and have upcoming screenings, so people could sort of look at how their how their setup works. Yeah. So uh, one of our customers, Live and Local and Air Film Society. Oh yeah, great. Yeah. They they are real uh, regular bookers with us, and they've had real positive feedback for us, and um, they I think they would be comparable. Okay, cool. Maybe maybe one of the team members could drop the uh, links in the chat. That would be fantastic. Yeah. I mean, the only, the question I had, what you know, this is something that you know, like, is always on my mind. Um, is to, from for just anecdotally, I'm sure you know that it's it's so new that this isn't maybe something that you've got a lot of feedback on. But from your experience, is it mainly about cross pollinating or existing audiences, or have there been sort of like a, maybe a bit of a broadening? It's a bit of both, really. So. Great. We want to try and capture as much as possible and the fact that you can have a hybrid screening um, which essentially uh, it sort of expands the audience reach was one of the intentions so that would help with the community cinemas and film societies to to you know expand who they're talking to and who they want to include we've had um film societies based in scotland who have members in northampton oh, so great. yeah so it's really opened up the and it's really um it's been quite positive for them. Oh, fantastic. And the, the one thing I, you know, I can imagine people um, uh, like have, maybe have, wouldn't consider in advance, but how, so how do people handle, how is tech support handled? So, you know, as you say, people sometimes struggling to, you know, with a new service, they sometimes take a little bit of time to understand how it all works. Is that done by the society or by your team? So we've, we've built this to be as easy as possible. So um, when they do log into the room, there is an opportunity to, um, uh, to test a screening and our show reel will play. Now, there's very little that can go wrong. As, 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 um, as long as we've, our setup is correct, it should work. And the other, if they troubleshoot it, it could be their internet connection, you know, it could be, it could be, you know, something that they're doing wrong or if they're on a tablet or a phone and they can't see the video. Right. But essentially, it is handled by the society and it will be up to the society to, to give the That's why, I mean, I think, you know, as as we sort of see when, you know, doing it in person, similar kind of setup, you know, there's, you know, you've got to run the projector. It's just an equivalent thing to bear in mind for people. Okay. We do, that... Yeah, we do have a troubleshooting guide, I should say. So, oh, okay. so that that's the... out. Yeah, that is going to help with with the bookings. Yeah, Amazing. so there's some sort of like you know kind of system to follow that you can just yes. kind of to, to help people troubleshoot. So that's good. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, um, I'm sure we'll come back to some more questions at the end, Ripinder. But that's um, I'm sure, and for the rest of the team. But um, uh, let's uh, for now we'll, we'll we'll press on with the rest of the presentation. Thanks okay. so much. Thank you. Great. All right. Um, I'll now go back to screen sharing mine. If I can just do that one second. Um, Okay, great. Okay, so um, moving on, um, I think you know, like we've just heard a really good example of um, you know a platform that's that's a that's a really good way to get involved on the ground floor and think about, you know if you're if you're something you're turning over um, about whether you want to get involved. Um, that's like it seems like a really fantastic um, system to to be able to sort of run a, run a pilot. But what I'm going to run through over the next few minutes is just um, you know some of the some of the, like a, a sort of decision matrix for how you would how you would decide about whether to get involved in um, online streaming and also whether you know which platform you you'd pick from. Um, and Ripinder's laid out quite a lot of the good, sort of good points of um, uh, VSR, um, and some so you can obviously tick some of these points off across what they've offered. So the first thing I'd say is just be really realistic about your capacity, like. If you're planning to run a cinema or you know your society full time, 
um at the same level you were before like what is your ex what like what actual capacity do you have and how are you going to manage that um it's really important to start off with like are you going to give like setting a putting an hour an hour number by how much time you're planning to put into it in the setup stage um the kind of teething stage and then the and then the sort of um maturity stage like how much time do you have week to week and then balancing that against some sense of aspirations about how much take up you're likely to have as I say, running a pilot can be a really powerful way to, um, to, to check that. And obviously VSR um, gives, gives people without, you know, heavy investment in um, um, a platform, you can test the water about how successful you've been, uh, how successful you potentially could be, um, and how much uptake there, there is. But another, another useful way to find out how, how likely people are to want to select you as their place to watch online video is through surveying your audience's interests now your audience's interest in taking it up um, and obviously you'll have different groups within that um, within within those segments and that will help you later if you feel like there is enough potential interest between people who already engage with your service then you can do a bit of segmentation to think about who we're going to, you know, of all the people who we surveyed, who are the most uh, easy wins for this service. And maybe we tailor the offer around those people. Um, one of the pieces of advice that I would give um, is to try and get it right first time. Um, it's much harder to get all of this in place and then, and then change it um, or change the offer that you're putting forward um that you know to revise it after you've got it up so make like of all you know of the biggest piece of advice i could give is just to try and spend as much time as possible in the um fact gathering and options consideration phase of things and it's really important to, to look at this not so much as um you know the, the initial buy-in but also any ongoing costs costs of and i'll discuss what those costs are later but don't think about this as like oh we built it and now um it's ready to go there's lots of um hidden extras that that eat into um what is initially quite a slim um can initially be quite a slim take up and profit or you know finance anyway not profit yet um so what are the other things you need to look for when you're considering platform? First of all, um, digital rights management. Um, so what that basically is, is um, prevent, pre prevention of privacy um, in, 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 you know, in simple terms. There's much more to it than that, but like that's, that's ultimately what it's aimed at, making sure that copyright holders um, can continue to protect their material. Um, now, there's always a, there's always a very, like, uh, big balance here between balancing how easy it is to use for, for users to use um, making sure that people who have legitimately paid for your um, service can get to what they want to do quickly and without a lot of technical fuss but also balancing the fact that you are often licensing material from um, big studios who have much much bigger concerns about piracy now um, I've used the image from Rafifi um, uh, with the with the um, safe crackers and you don't want that to be the experience that your um audience has um we've all had that experience i think if you bought anything on itunes where you think oh okay i just want to listen to that on my phone got the same apple account For some reason i can't access this um and you get very you know it can be very frustrating and obviously that has an so beyond this sort of frustration of I, I i bought it why can i not access it um it also has an impact on customer service and your reputation so good to think about like those things like you might want to go for a platform that maybe doesn't have such high um you know like high drm settings but also but means it's easier to use but you need to think about the fact that there's probably distributors who won't offer you their material um because of the the, the that lack of drm settings so the kind of things we're looking at are you know besides the usual you know the like the usual things um you know that's that stop people uh, pirating things like geo blocking so where is the material available is it set only you know you need to think about the fact that most people most distributors only have um the right to uh to, to share those films in one territory so you need to be able to block it only to uk streaming um, and then also the ability to block concurrent streams so people um, can't, you know, use their account and share it with four or five friends. So like, you know, it's one person, what, what, you know, one household, what, one stream. 
Um, and then also thinking about watermarking, which is one of the sort of both visible, both on screen. So, you know, occasionally it'll pop up with a, um, with your, with some identifying details um, and invisible watermarking, which if, if for some reason the material does make it out and is pirated, has some um, piece of identifying detail that can track back to whoever um, pirated the material. So all of those are like things that, um, there's more complex technical details in terms of how the stream is delivered that um, studios look for, but it's really important to think about um, what, you know, at what point along that DRM um, timeline of um, simplicity versus uh, piracy uh, and material you'll be able to access, because um, that will be very considerable, has considerable knock on later on. Um, Am I, what does the screening environment need to do? So I've got my picture of silent running there, um, thinking about um, the things that, you know, you, you, you like on a most basic level, obviously it needs to show films, um, but there's, you know, as we as Rupinder mentioned, you know, there's lots of other sort of functions you might want to do to make it a bit more of an all round experience and compensate from the, for the uh, lack of uh, live in-person um, energy. So, does your platform let you add bonus content like trailers and um and and pre-roll like you know maybe you want to have a little idem for your cinema um or maybe a sponsor or you know trailers for upcoming films can you add those to a pre-roll um before the main feature plays that's really that can be really useful powerful way of um queuing people into who you are as an organization and what you've got coming up um does the platform that you've got have um uh like a, you know let you do um q and a's within the platform or is that something you're going to have to host elsewhere the platform that ico uses shift 72 is really almost exclusively for um showing films rather than doing some of the other work around that there are other options in the business that let you stream into them um for a live q a which is a very powerful audience um plus um like eventive lets you use open broadcast software to to do that um, but it's, you know, there's lots of trade-offs um, for using different platforms. So can, can you host a stream Q&A um, is really important question to consider. Um, and also, can you add pre-recorded Q&As? Um, and then, you know, it's good to hear from Rapinda that different dubs are available um, and different uh, captions um, are selectable because obviously, um, we want, you know, the, one of the nice things about working online is there's much more digital, there's a framework for much more flexibility about how the material is watched. So you can add um, caption subtitles for deaf and hard of hearing audiences, or alternatively, if you had, an, you can select different tracks of audio, you could, you could add an audio description track, but does your, you know, not all platforms um, let you have multiple captions and multiple um, audio tracks to choose from. So that's something to consider when you're assessing. Now, the, you know, it, it, it all does come down to money at the end of the day, um, depressingly. Um, so how can you, you know, what are the things to look for in terms of how the fee is structured? So on the, on the most basic level, there's usually a, a platform fee so that you have to buy into their system and, and you know, it's, it's a pay to play, a hurdle to clear, just to be able to have access to it on the regular before you even put any content on there. That varies a lot between platforms and that's one of the biggest things for smaller exhibitors by thinking about it and why VSR is so appealing is that there's there's not that buy-in for the um for to have access to the platform you know you're paying for the for the individual um screening um and then there's the you know film unlock fees that go on top of that so every time someone clicks a film um they that means that they you, you get charged an individual price per film um, and it's important, one thing that's often um, uh, overlooked is credit card handling fees, and you might have to have your own credit card system set up like Stripe to deliver those. So that's another sort of percentage over, uh, on top. Um, and then often sometimes, you know, for if you're if you're trying to work with big, some of the bigger studios, they will ask for more commitments to DRM. So some of those sort of like high end DRM services like personally identifiable, indivisible watermarking can the, the services can levy an extra fee on top of that. And then there's things like per screening fees. So like the amount you're um, charging you know, per like per event you're putting on. Um, and you know you can do bundling so like this is an, this is on the other side of things where it's like you how you can make money so do you want to have some opportunity to do like and like one of the things that 
film festival is obviously very keen on is offering a kind of like all you can eat 30 pounds 50 pounds for a ticket to every screening we're doing um but that's that that is something you're going to need to think about how, how the how you you're structuring the experience for users as well as how much you're paying out to others then thinking about distributor split because unfortunately they still want to take money for giving you a film um and finally, um, there's, all, there's also just a whole world of um, hosting costs. So like how much does it cost to have, you know, like, like there's normally sort of like an amount of, of si like size of material you can have on the platform. So maybe you'd have like five terabytes at a certain price. And if you want to host more films concurrently, um, you need to think about, you might, you might need to expand the storage you've got. Um, and then bandwidth, so like literally how many people have streamed the material, like, you know, you might be charged, you know, like there's, like there's sort of that, and that's worked out in kind of like gigabytes of streaming. Um, and, you know, you need to think about the quality of resolution of the files you're uploading, because that has an impact on the bandwidth people are using. And then finally ingestion. So like you upload a file to the streaming platform, and then it does some work in the background to make sure it's going to play seamlessly on every platform imaginable. But there's always, a, there's generally a cost to do that work in the background so it's um there's definitely a lot of costs potentially involved i've sort of hopefully this doesn't scare anyone off these are just you know like as i say there are loads of um much um more um user friendly or like uh low, lower barrier to entry but it's good to think about all these hidden costs and, and to be forewarned if you're thinking about seriously investing now, programming is a really big area for, um, uh, and, and something that I think is is still emerging as a piece of best practice, um, because people's approach to programming is, is not really, I don't think it's clarified about how, how you're going to approach this. Um, now, um, there's a temptation to think about um, programming you know, like as independent cinemas, we often have this feeling of like, oh, the more we, the more we have available, the, the, the more audiences will reach. Um, and, you know, we should be trying to hit everything uh, at once. And, um, and in actuality, that can feel like, you know, I've got my Indiana Jones um, Raiders, the Lost Ark image here, like, you know, you're just putting another, like, you know, the, 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 the Ark of the Covenant, that fantastic piece of programming you've put lots of energy into, is just lost amongst, um, thousands of other items and to be honest the advice i would give is that um we're never going to compete as independent cinemas with the 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 feeling of um breadth of material that we you know we're all faced with every night that you sit down um with your partner or your flatmate or even on your own and you think what am i going to watch tonight and there's probably you know if you haven't got something very clear in mind it's not some burning item on your list there's an a seemingly endless painful process of finding um what you're going to watch my recommendation is to sort of is to zig where they zag and to have a think about doing the work that cinemas do um partly out of the the, the material restrictions of having a, a, a cinema with only a certain number of screens um but to say to people we really this is the one film or two films that we really think you should watch at home this week um, and pressing, doing that work of curatorship and really um, being enthusiastic about a limited number of things, because that is a USP that other, that, um, other streaming services don't have. So it might seem tempting because there's, you know, seemingly endless um, capacity to host material, but it's um, important not to get go too broad with your inventory. Then you've got to think about like, you know, generally what's your approach going to be? Are you going to work with new releases that have a bit more um, profile um, or is it going to be a bit more, you know, like, uh, and Ellen will speak a bit more about this, I hope in a few moments, is it going to be more about, is your USP going to be unique material, things that are local, things that are, you know, that you've created yourself, like short film programs, like, is that, is that how you're going to make yourself stand out and make people pick you above, above our what's on Amazon Prime? Could you do a festival partnership? Um, could you connect with local film clubs? Could they, could they, um, could they, you know, like as we were talking about partnerships earlier, like are there people who, you know, who, who could be your, you know, your advocates for a certain type of cinema? Um, and then are you like, is the programming, is some of the programming free, you know, and that helps you get people on the platform using it for the first time. And then that helps you convert them to paid and be in your marketing channels. Like, is there some material that's that's desirable or maybe you, you play at a loss to get people into that um, funnel? Um, and 
once we have the opportunity to play these films alongside um, the, uh, the main the, uh, in-person program, is your approach going to be to go day and date, you know, a la Curzon, everything that we distribute is available both in our cinemas and online day of release, or is this more of an interesting, um, interesting sort of parallel or contrasting um, program uh, or complementary program? Like you could have screened something in the main screen that's, um, you know, like, you know, what we're looking at sort of um, after love um in in your in the cinema when it's released and then online you know there's an opportunity to show the best of uh, british south asian shorts um to to go along with aleem khan's um uh new film or you know are, or is it more like oh we, we you know we show the blockbusters in cinema and then we do the indie films um online i mean needless to say i wouldn't recommend that approach but that you know there's lots of different ways we can look at programming um and it's good to be mindful of what you're doing and just before we get into Ellen's um, uh, uh, presentation, and I'm sure she's going to touch on marketing because that's her job. Um, and from my experience working with her, she's very good at it. Um, like think about the marketing piece, because I think this is something really, it, it's hard, it's often overlooked. Um, so how established are your digital channels? Like, you know, how, how good are you at reaching people f um, f through only digital means? Because that's, that's going to be your biggest audience um like how big is your mailing list how much do, social media interaction and engagement do you get like those are really really significant metrics to judge whether you are you're going to be likely to to find um a good footing for a digital cinema offer um and one thing that i see a lot of people struggling with in this period um from those who have taken the plunge already is the is especially when cinemas were able to open and can maintain their digital offering is how you differentiate those in the space because lots of times people you know from my experience however clear you think you've been people will often say oh well i thought i could watch this in person or i thought this is online um and you know they'll, how do you how do you make that message clear on your website and in venue um, how are you going to find these new audiences? Because, you know, the, the, the promise of these um, platforms is that, you know, not only are you going to convert lots of people who are, um, come to your venue generally to, to maybe increasing the amount they're watching as well as visiting in person, but there's everyone in the UK or around the world could watch these films, but they're not going to know about it amongst the thousand other screaming options out there unless you have a really clear strategy to reaching them. And as I say, um, you know, like what you need to spend some time thinking about what your USP is for viewers. And I think Ellen, Ellen and what they've done at QFT um, player is like demonstrates that really well. So I won't say too much about that, but thinking about like, what is the thing, you know, you're not going to have the slickest platform compared to Netflix. Um, you're not going to have the, the, the range of someone like Amazon Prime. So what is the reason um, that your people are going to um, spend time on your player? Is it because they feel like, oh, I really want to support the, the cinema? Is it because you have material that is that, that would never be under consideration by a tech giant? Um, these are all these are all really important things to think about when you're thinking about marketing offers and what the offer of the platform is. And as I said, I hopefully I've made it clear throughout that it's really important to think long term about these things. You know, like um, cinemas have been forced into um, approach into this approach and thinking about these things but it's probably something we should have all been thinking about anyway and so hopefully um having been forced to take the plunge or consider it um this is something that uh, cinemas can um think about um beyond beyond when we can reopen so what's the what's the long-term thinking and how can you know anyone we convert online become part of the broader family so that's that's really that's a key consideration Okay, so now I'm very happy to turn over to Ellen. I'm sure she'll be able to fill in some of the, some of the sort of things I've hinted at. Um, yeah, so I'll pass it over. Just on mute myself um, and sharing my screen. Uh, I'm looking forward to talking a bit more about it. Um, share. There we go. Is that wide for everybody? It's all good. Okay. So uh, I'm Ellen, as uh, Duncan said, I'm the marketing coordinator at QFT. And so I'm going to talk a bit more about going down that owned VOD route. Um, but I'll talk less about the sort of practicalities of how we set it up because we've got quite a lot of written information on that. So if you're interested in that side, then you can find that quite easily online on the bigger picture. Um, but more the why we went for this model and some of the things that we've learned from the experience. 
and the things that I think are important to consider before you decide to go down your own sort of virtual path. Um, if you don't know QFT, we are Northern Ireland's uh, only full-time independent art house cinema. Um, and we launched QFT Player back in April 2020. So not quite before the pandemic, but it was so quick that you could probably have, um, uh, have thought that about two weeks after we closed, um, we launched when a festival partner that we work with regularly um, came to us with a filmed version of Abomination, a DUP opera, and wanted a chance to show it online. And so we jumped at that and within two days we had a, a platform set up and we were ready to launch with our first screening. Um, at this stage now we've had over 37,000 plays, which is about 180 sold out screenings in our biggest screen. Um, Need to hit that. Uh, like I said, there is a lot more in-depth information about the how you set up a platform like Vimeo TT on the uh, bigger picture, uh, including a how-to video. Um, but I'll just highlight a couple of things that were important and why we chose it. Um, we needed a platform that um, had a pretty minimal financial in input to start off with because we didn't have the money to be spending thousands on some of the slightly more sophisticated platforms. So there was no large upfront setup fee. And instead what there is is a per subscriber fee, a per transaction fee, and then fees for the amount of hours you upload onto the platform. Um, so it means that really you are being charged in accordance with how much you're using it rather than having to outlay a huge amount to begin. Uh, and we also wanted a platform that could be quite flexible. We wanted to be able to show um, uh, films for free as well as to have ones available for um, renting video on demand. Um, uh, we didn't feel like we needed the live broadcast um, option uh, just as uh, this would put the cost up considerably. And also we thought it would lead to more um, uh, customer service because there will be people interacting with it live and therefore we would have to have members of our team there live as well to support that. Um, there are some drawbacks to Vimeo OTT which I'll cover a little bit uh, as I talk through some other things but I still think it's a really good all-rounder if you're uh, working with a smaller budget and thinking about going along this road. Um, in that um, bigger picture article, there is a link to a session from Together Films, which is really great for um, highlighting some of the main sort of contenders in terms of the different platforms that you could use if you want to find out more about your options. So we knew that we wanted to launch a player basically as soon as we closed. And actually, some of us, we had been sort of thinking about how you might move online generally anyway. And then Abomination just was a, a jump start and made us go right for it. Um, we wanted to do it because we felt it was really important for us to maintain our, um, our connection with our audiences and to continue to be able to offer something that was special from us to them. Um, it's been really important to us this uh, last year. And uh, I think we would have felt really sad if we couldn't have offered some form of cinema to our audiences, seeing as we've only been open, I think maybe four months of the last year, maybe actually less, I think. Um, and um, yeah, three, oh, that's sad. Um, but, um, but it's not always been super easy and we've had to learn quite a lot along the way. And I would also say that it's not a huge financial success. It's not a, a failure or anything like that. Like we're not losing money from it, but it's not a big money maker. And so if people are thinking about that, I think maybe there is a time for that along the line as um, cinemas develop this um, capacity, but at the minute it is definitely not that situation. Um, but there are a few things that I think are important to take into account before you uh, launch into something like this. So the first thing really is that your competition changes. I, I've never really been the sort of person who thinks that streaming and cinemas are in competition. I think if you're enjoying films, you're enjoying films. Uh, and what you're in competition with as a cinema is other social interactions um, or other thing, events that can happen outside the house, going out for a meal, whatever that might be. Um, 
But that's not the case once you move into uh, virtual screenings because you are then in the digital landscape and as well as competing with doing the laundry or reading or whatever you might have going on in your house, you're also competing with home entertainment giants like iPlayer and Netflix and Prime um, who um, are much more familiar to audiences, uh, both in terms of how they use the technology and just that they think of them. Uh, they've got an established relationship. And then in terms of the visibility on, you know, they're on their smart TVs um, and then the budgets. So they can spend so much money on making sure you know that what they're showing, when they're showing it. Um, but that is not the case for smaller operators. It's really difficult to cut through that wealth of entertainment at home, which Duncan sort of um, called on already, because in your audience's mind, you are something that they go out to and they have a relationship that is external to home and might have a social aspect or it's it's something different. And they, on top of that, have pre-existing relationships with streaming platforms um, at home as well. Um, so the most important thing I think when you're going into it is to think about what your USP is. So to find your niche. Um, for us, we discovered that the work that has really done the best on QFT player are local films and shorts. Um, because we've got relationships with local festivals, uh, Northern Ireland Screen and local filmmakers, we've really taken the opportunity with a QFT player to support those. Um, and uh, all of our top 10 most successful titles on QFT player are local uh, content, whether that is short films or feature films, um, which it was something that we always do in our program anyway, but it was something that we felt was really important to pull through. And it's very interesting to see that that is what people have been engaging with more so than necessarily new uh, independent releases. Um, so I would say to everybody to reflect on your own organization and think about what makes you special and is it something that can be recreated, recreated online it, or does it have to be a screening? Is it something else? You know, um, uh, it worked for us, but that doesn't mean that it is necessarily what's in your own organization's DNA. Um, to connect it to what you show, then there's the how. So I would say it's important to think about your release model. Um, I don't think we've cracked this yet because we've tried all sorts of things. We um, So, you know, you can have a VOD release that, you know, you can only rent it for this week or this day or whatever it might be. Or you could have a limited free release where something is available to watch for free on the thing, but only for 24 hours or 48 hours. Um, it depends on whether you want to have a regular release pattern as well. So one of the things that we are doing when it comes to um, the new releases, which is partly dictated by the distributors as well, is releasing new VOD titles on a Friday the same way you would have new VO, new um, cinema, new films in the cinema on a Friday. Um, or whether you're thinking about just doing these as really special one-off events that exist for a night and that is it, um, or creating a bigger catalog. Uh, for us, one of the things that we found has worked really well is uh, the limited free release model uh, and then followed by a, a limited VOD release. So where we have something available for 24 or 48 hours to watch for free. And then if you miss it, maybe for the week after that, you can rent it. Um, I think it's a really important thing. It gives um, the audience some of that feeling of watching something at the same time or at least a similar time, but it uh, avoids the complications of technology hurdles if somebody isn't sure quite how that works and feels like they're gonna miss out if they pause or any of those sorts of things. Um, and it also introduces scarcity into the mix, um, which means that people will think to act now rather than uh, how all your watch lists are on streaming platforms where you're like, I'll get around to that at some point. Um, so the other thing I uh, think is really important to think about is how you plan to build your audience. Uh, it's not really as simple as just taking your in-person audience and then them becoming your online audience. Um, for lots of people have a relationship with you that is completely analog. So those people aren't going to necessarily engage and there are potentials to engage with other people as well. So obviously data is your friend when it comes to working out what's happening with uh, your, your audiences for online um, because 
it's not like you can see them or can ask them questions easily. Um, so um, I think uh, it's really important to think about the platform you're using and what you can learn about your online audience from it and whether you can work out whether they're the same audience as your in-person audience and what you can use that data for in terms of marketing in the future for both online and in-person um, screenings. Uh, so one of the big downfalls with uh, Vimeo OTT in terms of marketing and audience development is um, our, our free screenings are by and large the most popular ones that people tune in like in their thousands for, for something that they can watch for free um, where they might be in their tens for something you have to pay for. Um, but when it comes to the free screenings on Vimeo OTT, there is no need to log in. You can just watch for free. For the customer, that's brilliant because all you have to do is click the link and it's there. But um, for us, it means that we don't know who those people are and uh, we're missing out on developing a relationship with them. They might come and just watch that one thing and then unless they follow us online or uh, they've signed up to our newsletter, they'll never hear from us again. Um, but fortunately, we can learn a bit more from our VOD customers. Um, it takes a bit of work because you have to do lots of comparing of uh, email lists. But um, we have worked out that uh, our VOD customers, are, over half of them are uh, members of some kind. kind. So, uh, and there may well be others in that other half that have a relationship with us, but just don't have a digital relationship with us, don't subscribe to our newsletter or aren't a member. Um, but so that means that they're interacting with us through our website instead of through necessarily email marketing or social media. Um, and uh, you can also use other data tools at your disposal. So for us, we can use uh, Google Analytics and the Vimeo Analytics and see sort of how people are coming to uh, Vimeo TT. So uh, they, we're getting about just shy of 20% are coming directly from our website, which is a real clear sign that we have to make that part of the journey as clear as possible. And it's one of the things that we've been working on in the past few months, particularly in relationship to when we were reopened and how you make that distinction. So now in our what's on, we have like a separate area for what's on QFT player and what's on in the cinema. And in front of every QFT player, we put QFT player in the title just to make it extra clear. If you land on that page, it's a, it's a streaming title. Um, but, uh, and then we've also found that uh, just shy of 30% are coming from Facebook and Twitter. So our social media is really important in terms, it was much more than I was expecting, to be honest. Um, but uh, we are quite fortunate to have a, a decent size following on both of those. So we've got about 20,000, uh, slightly over 20,000 on Twitter, Facebook, and about a similar amount on our email um, list as well. So there's a lot of people that we can talk to directly about it. Um, uh, uh, another workaround for how we can um, tell people more directly about QFT Player is um, through our email provider um, and uh, that list. Uh, and luckily through our provider, we've got ways to segment our audience. So although Vimeo OTT doesn't connect to our box office, um, we can use uh, things like how pe whether people have clicked on links to see their interest in, uh, in online screenings and also particularly their interest in specific type of films. So then we can use that in uh, future cases with uh, in-person screenings if we're like oh well we showed this uh, director's film online but actually um, they've got something else coming out now and it's going to be in the cinema so we can use that as a way to inform our marketing in the future but it is much more labor intensive because it's not connected to our box office system it involves a lot more work on our end to do that um, and then uh, the last thing before I sort of ruminate a little bit on the future is thinking about customer experience and service. So uh, obviously if there's a problem in the cinema, somebody comes out and tells you this is not working, but uh, you need to think about how that will work online. So while many people are familiar with Netflix or iPlayer and or even VOD uh, renting from Amazon or from Google Play, with creating your own players, you have to familiarize your audience with another type of platform. So when we launched, we just had the single screening. So we could um, message everywhere on social, in our emails and on our website about how to interact with uh, 
uh, QFT player just for that screening. Um, and uh, even with that, uh, we had to be online all at the same time so we could be fielding whether there were questions coming in through email or whether they were coming in through social media. Um, but uh, as we've gone on, we've incorporated more types of releases. So having VOD and um, having things that you can pre-book and then get released as well. Um, uh, one of the, there's also other issues with thinking about how your platform is when people are used to using a, one particular platform, they expect all platforms to be like that. And so uh, with Vimeo OTT, if you offer anything for free, it requires you to offer a subscription um, option. So everywhere on the site, they're asking you to subscribe, but there is no need to subscribe to uh, watch any of those free films. And also um, there is, uh, and if you're going to buy something, then you have to buy it separately. It's, there's not any titles that we have that are available just for subscription, just because negotiating the rights for that is sort of beyond our capacity at the minute. Um, because of that, that means that we spend a long time messaging everywhere, no need to subscribe, no need to subscribe. And eventually we uh, decided that the easiest way really was to um, keep on forewarning people of this. So we've created a blog on our website, which gives you the full explanation. And also sometimes you say no need to, describe, to subscribe and people don't understand why and they'll just go for it anyway. So that way we could explain a little bit like, this is something that has to, we have to offer, but you don't need to do it like you can enjoy this for free. Um, we also created uh, FAQs as well. So basically if you're on the website, it's quite clear how you can find information about QFT player. I think there's probably still work to be done with this, but as time has gone on, we're getting much uh, fewer emails asking how the system works. Um, and I think one of the things that I would say if when you're thinking about customer service is basically to think about like what could go wrong, how could it be misinterpreted and preempt all those questions so you have something there that you can refer to and people within your team can refer to if you're going to be divvying up that sort of customer service experience. Um, I think it's really important as well that it's clear that you have a contact line for when that happens. So for us, we're saying basically to tweet at us or to um, email us on our generic emails so it can be easily accessed. Um, most of the uh, like queries or complaints that we got were never because of the platform not working, but rather audience members struggling to use it. Um, and they could be fixed easily, but they required staff time and uh, to understand and to solve the problem. So it's really important to remember that what's intuitive to you is not always intuitive to someone else. Um, so yes, just thinking about the future a little bit, it's, it's really been a real lifeline to us throughout the pandemic and um, making it work requires just as much consideration as a cinema program and um, and the willingness to think a bit differently. Um, we are we plan to keep it running when the cinema reopens and there's lots of potential for it, both in terms of developing audiences for niche interests. One of the brilliant things about it has been seeing a real uh, rise in people watching short films on the platform, which I think often we don't give as much space to in the cinema because they're seen as being slightly riskier. So it's a way to say, no, there are people here for this type of content, which then can inform your programming in the cinema as well. Um, and in terms of uh, access, there's lots to uh, think about and definitely stuff that we could be doing to improve our access offer with QFT player, but it's something that we're really invested in. And particularly as we move out of the pandemic, when there will, you know, cinemas just won't be accessible to some people who even they were accessible to before, so we really need to make sure that they are being served. Um, but yes, that's a whole other conversation. Um, thanks for, for listening, but yeah, if you've got any questions. Let me know. Thanks so much, Alan. That's really comprehensive and hopefully uh, some food for thought people, you know, moving up the scale and sort of um, there's lots there's lots to take away from there and lots to think about. Um, I'm going to open it up to um, the floor. And if you want to either put a question in the chat or um, if you want to come on the mic, um, come on camera and and talk and put, put the question to either me or the uh, panelists. Um, before we get into that, um, please do start posting questions that you have in the chat. 
chat and I'll also come around to um, any of the questions and the points that were raised prior to now. Um, I just wanted to ask you, Ellen, like what sort of things, you know, like it, it seems like as much as I've talked about the, the whole thing of trying to um, prepare as much as pop possible in your op options considerations, inevitably there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a point at which you have to just take a run at it and accept that, that you're not going to know everything until you have it in place what are the things that looking back um that you would have that would have surprised you if you'd told you about this sort of like, like a year ago um I, I am actually quite surprised about the limited uptake on new releases um and uh i think particularly because you know within the cinema what people were coming to see when the cinema reopened they wanted to see new releases they didn't really want to see things um uh, that they had seen before where that's a slightly different um situation to what's happening with their home viewing um but that's only stuff that we can learn as we go along and also it may not always be the case it might just be as people are adjusting to that when when they've got through all of their comfort viewing what they want to watch afterwards and obviously we see that that's not the case when it's coming to local titles but um and for the most part those ones are titles that like haven't really been available before um or have been available in a very limited thing uh, circumstance so i think that it's really important to think about yeah that like what is special how you make it special is there something you can do in your programming to make it special yeah i think that's so that it's, it's so interesting to me that you know what yeah as you say the thing that most people come to your cinema um to get is like oh what's fresh this week you know kind of like partly i'm guessing it's part it's because of the more perhaps more limited profile that films have um with the kind of marketing budgets that distributors have um so yeah at the moment but also it's just uh you know there's I, I guess the thing is you you need to as you say so clearly like dig into what your niche is and I guess my next question is around that how how do you think so what the th seems like the you know obviously QFT is a, you know a local venue to Belfast but it's also like very strongly you know like what you know probably uh, almost inarguably um northern ireland's um strongest independent cinema so it sort of has a national character as well like what's the you know if people are looking to dig into some of those more, more um local kind of uh screening options what what what's what would you say the is the approach people could take uh well what's happened with us has been sort of a range of things so one of it uh one of the things um was that our programmer had a relationship with john t davis the uh the documentarian and so we got uh, lots of his films to show on it um but it's also about making yourself open we had short films that have come in from local filmmakers where they've just said i've got this film and you know we've watched it and we've loved it and we've wanted to put it on the player um I think if you can, it's really good to uh, collaborate with other organizations in your area. So uh, having a relationship with Northern Ireland Screen means that we have a relationship with short filmmakers, having a relationship with the university here, being part of it. Um, we uh, have a relationship with the film course and therefore the filmmakers that come out of that. Um, so really, it's about reaching out to people at the minute and seeing uh, what how you can help each other out. Yeah, no, I mean, I think I think that's so, I mean, we all know from running film, short film programs that you're, you know, generally, you can always sell at least 10 tickets to the filmmakers and, and their family. So it's good to, uh, it's good to see that you're keeping that model alive. But obviously, you know, it, it's definitely something that, as I've said, you know, as I said, in my presentation, you know, the, the big tech um, companies are never going to be worried about like Northern Irish, Northern Irish shorts, much to their loss. But um, it's always good, you know. It's good. To, it's good to hear that you're that that which might have seemed like a more niche um, thing in other programs is really coming to the fore for you. Do you think there's anything that you've seen do well online that, that you know you, you think, oh, okay, actually, we've discovered a new audience that we wouldn't have thought of that you could potentially cross pollen. You know, like you'd think, you know, maybe this is more of a question for Michael, the programmer. But do you think there's things that you would go, say, oh, this has actually uncovered something we wouldn't have taken a risk on that that we. Could can see there is at least a, a, an audience for um hmm, i'm not well i'm not sure anything in particular but i would say definitely like um that the shorts have really been the thing that's um struck me but i'm trying to think if there's anything else that has done shockingly well um 
Well, actually, it's not really a surprise, but Abomination, a DUP opera, did so well for us. And we obviously do really well with anti-lives and things like that. But it's maybe thinking about, well, is there a way to do that with um, local theatres to um, support local uh, theatrical productions? Um, mm. Because obviously, um, sometimes it's just that people don't feel comfortable in a theater space where they might feel comfortable in a cinema one. Um, and uh, yes, like we could have sold out, I don't know, 50 odd shows of the amount of people that watched uh, Abomination, or maybe not 50, but a load, a load of shows. Yeah, yeah. No, but that's really, yeah, I mean, I, I think, yeah, it does definitely um, open up a whole new, new avenue of um, revenue stream and different types of content. Oh, that's fantastic. Um, Okay, so uh, now I'm going to open it up. So I'm going to go back to some. So I'll bring back in Film Bank and uh, uh, Ellen simultaneously. So I'm just going to go back to some of the earlier points that were raised. Um, uh, while we're going through, um, John asked me about um, <laughs> slightly, uh, slightly uh, dis disagreeing with my point about collaboration. So uh, you know, and some 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 points that I think are you know quite um, you know are distributors open to collaboration? And I say yes. Um, the things that we've seen at the ICO, the people are, are, are more open to, um, check, you know, to uh, either negotiating or, or collaborating on our things like rates, because, you know, like different, the terms that people are booking films on are slightly different than we might have looked at before. And there's lots of discussion around that and more flexibility. So I think that is, and in general, people have had a more collaborative approach. Um, and more flexibility around previews, um, you know, like lots of lots of filmmakers, lots of distributors have offered um, some uh, either early release or potentially we've seen different, you know, more opportunities for Q and A's because obviously everyone is has generally had more free time and also that the, the the travel times cut down, so we've had a, li a lot more um, opportunity for Q and A's through digital means. And also distributors have had more flexibility around windowing, like there's lots of films that I know would never have been considered for day and day or, e or even digital first release. Um, so that's a lot more flexibility on their part. And um, okay, John also- but, uh, but Duncan, you weren't, uh, you weren't addressing that really. You're addressing the question of screening films and um, partnering with the distributors to get the screening. And our experience has been with uh, all the distributors that we normally work with. Mm -hmm. uh, singularly failed to have anyone that was uh, um, uh, uh, offering a, a partnership. Um, the, this news from Film Bank is very good because that's exactly the sort of thing we were looking for. But is Film Bank unique there or are no. there other distributors? Because yeah. most of them, like Curzon, for instance, they're setting up their own kind of Amazon Prime. So the number of distributors... Uh, is very small that might do that sort of thing. Yeah, I mean, so the other, the two that I definitely look most closely into if you're sort of thinking like how almost all of the modern films catalog has an affiliate model. So you can become an affiliate and have a platform there. So, and they actually, they actually has, have sort of become an umbrella organization for a lot of different um, distributors who maybe don't have the resources to invest in their own platform. So I know um, New Wave Films and Verve have both also become like partners of Modern. So you can become a, more or less most most things that um, in the, uh, you know, or like recent releases in Verve, Modern and um, New Wave. Uh, yeah, what Verve, Modern, New Wave's catalogue have been put on there. So you can become an affiliate there. So that's one. Um, Peccadillo also, you know, um, you know, represent a lot, you know, like the UK's biggest um, queer cinema um, distributor. They they have they work with Vimeo as uh, for an affiliate model. So a lot of their catalogue, both current and past, um, has been put on Vimeo, and you can get a cut of any, you know, if you you know, similar to um, uh, to modern, you can get become a sort of an affiliate of their service, and you don't need to own the platform. Um, so yeah, th those are the two that I, that's to bring to mind, but I believe there's others, maybe other people on the call have had experience that, but th those are the two places I'd start looking, John. Okay, thank you. Very I mean, simple. I think it's important um, from, uh, I'm very encouraged by listening to the two other presentations, and I think it's important to, to remember that even when the cinema is open again, um, it won't be uh, the sort of audiences that we normally expect for some time. And therefore, um, um, we will need to sort of see whether we can supplement that. The other thing is as well, I mean, we're an independent 
art center with a cinema and theater. So we've only got one auditorium. So um, typically, and here I'm knocking the distributors again, um, we're not able to take the uh, films on the first or even the second week of release without a big commitment. Um, and therefore we've got to wait till the third or fourth week. Um, this is probably a way or maybe a way of um, really um, uh, screening those films early. So, yeah, uh, there's lots yeah. of good things that we could do. Yeah, I think there's, you know, I think I think that is another way that the distributors are a bit more, more flexible in terms because the commitment's much lower. There's, yeah, there is potential to get things earlier within the window. Um, so yeah, I think that isn't a, a potential advantage. Although you know, obviously you're competing with a lot more people, but it does mean that for a local audience, you're really like making the most of the um, the early release pub, uh, marketing. So just a few more few more questions that I've seen from the chat. Um, Carmen um, at Depo was asking about, um, which is something that actually I was wondering myself. Um, the generally the film bank licenses are not available for um, theatrical sort of DCP venues. Um, is that is that is that also true for VSR titles? If you work so if you're sort of like you know a kind of full time DCP venue, can you use VSR licenses? Uh, no, so this is for a non-theatrical. This is a theatrical service, so it wouldn't be it won't be for any theatrical cinemas or any first-run cinemas. Fortunately, but we are seeing that. So this is primarily offered to community cinemas and film societies, but we are seeing other non-theatrical markets opening up to this, who are very keen, like universities and also corporate organisations as well. So we will extend that out to them, which we are doing at the moment, but unfortunately not to theatrical. Okay, that's good to know. And um, I just asked about. Can I uh, ask why that is actually? Um, because why are you I'm, excluding the uh, indep small um, independent cinemas? We don't exclude that. That is our license terms with our partners. So we can't we can't license in a theatrical venue because they have their theatrical runs of their own film. So we can't we can't go into that that market. So it's the distributors again. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> John, you're really down on them. Yeah, they've got a hard job. They've got a hard job. Um, so, um, yeah, so I was just asked about, you know, if you, one of the big advantages from a VSR, it seems, is the fact that people can do chat, with, uh, have a chat function there. Um, what's, you know, we'd hope that most people um, are well behaved, but, you know, even within sessions at the ICO and Film of Sound Feast, we've sometimes had to moderate people. What's the opportunity to moderate the chat if things are going awry? So at the moment, it's you can't modify it. And there's there's a reason for that because when we when we created this, this service, we wanted it to support community hubs like community cinemas and film societies. And we had to bring it to a most accessible price point. Um, and Although it's not available at the moment, it is in our roadmap to have that development as we bring on, um, you know, new markets and new customers who can, you know, who, who can um, establish VSR within their markets as well. So at the moment, it's a no. Yeah, I mean, I have to imagine that um, at, at the scale that people are looking at and the kind of audience they're likely to reach, it's probably going to be mainly friendly types. You don't have to worry about sort of... I hope um, so, yeah. So when I get the other one. The, the, well, there's all even even in established audiences, there's always one. Um, you know, we all have to, but I, I don't think folks probably don't need to worry quite so much about like Zoom bombing, especially when it's you know <laughs> just text chat really. Um, one other question, technological question that someone uh, that, um, Stuart from the Old Town Hall was asking was, um, you know, uh, sorry, just, hopefully you can hear me above the, the lawn mowing outside. Um, was about the. Um, opportunity to do casting so like apple tv and um, chromecast and um, is that something you're looking at for the future that might so, be one. yeah i don't mind i don't mean to sort of pass the buck but i'm going to pass this over to our director of product development who could probably answer this probably a bit better than me so rob are you there hey no problem hi Ripon. thanks for that um look that's a really good question and i'm really glad you've asked uh, it's it, so the reason for it is actually uh, very closely related to the answer Appendix gave just a second ago about chat moderation. So a lot of the development work was about leaving things on the roadmap so we could hit an accessible price point because supporting uh, community cinemas and 
you know, being able to be there to allow, you know, exhibitors to continue reaching their audiences meant building something that was affordable um, for the scale uh, of the operation. And when it comes to casting, uh, it's prevented uh, because of the DRM. And obviously, Duncan, you mentioned DRM at the top of this. It, it, it's really important. We take our responsibility for protecting uh, the creative works of our licensors. We take it very seriously and we protect all of that content. And part of that protection is not being able uh, to stream from something that's on the internet. So casting, so casting and mirroring and those kind of technologies are controllable but only from within a, in, within an app. And what we found, there were two elements that made us choose to not go down the app route. And one of them is it creates a technological barrier to entry. So it's another step audiences have to go through before they can participate. And that we found was something people weren't that keen on doing. They'd much rather just go to a website, enter the details, watch the movie. So keeping it as stripped back and simple for the audience. And then the other thing is the thing I mentioned at the top, it's cost. As soon as you develop an app, you have to maintain across a, lot, a, a much broader range of ecosystems and the cost escalates really dramatically. And so to keep that broadest possible access, we, we looked at just keeping that cost base pinned down and we, we made that choice. So coming with that, the downside of that upside was the, you know, the casting and mirroring option had to come off the table because it meant we wouldn't be able to properly continue protecting the IP from our license source. That makes sense, Rob. Yeah, no, I, I, you know, and, and I, I suppose one of the other factors is that, you know, um, obviously anytime you have casting ability um, or, you know, hooking up to a HDMI cable, that potentially infringes on an opportunity to screen that film through another, you know, like potentially that means that people could screen it in a theatrical context. That, that's absolutely right. And, and yeah, it's, it's about the security, but it is worth saying for people who want the most cinematic experience, the connection through an HDMI cable to a big screen projector, it's much more secure than that wireless one. And it's not just something we support, like we really actively encourage it so you can get the most cinematic experience possible at home. So okay. it works for computers, so PCs, laptops. We really do encourage people to pipe that out to a second screen, get that big screen experience if they can. Okay, that's worth knowing. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't appreciate that. So yeah, because normal, I sometimes find that if it's no casting, it's also no HDMI cable. So that's good. So people can yeah. and put it on a, on a, on something better than their laptop screen. Yeah, okay. no, definitely. Yeah, the the technology on the actual wire. There's a conversation between the devices that's much more monitorable yeah. from a security point of view. Great stuff. Um, so Ellen, just one question. Just we we get we're coming up to time now. Um, but I just wanted to, uh, Tom um, from the Ultimate Picture Palace was just asking, um, how does it work in terms of uploading films onto the platform? Is that, um, do the distributors upload it directly to themselves or do they send you files? Uh, we get sent files that then we upload. So there is work then involved in, um, in doing the downloading and uploading and making sure you've got plenty of space on your laptop for, for that. <laughs> Oh yeah, this is my struggle for uh, virtual screening days. Um, so uh, yeah, I feel you. Um, and having had fibre broadband installed over this period um, has changed my life. Uh, just that, just watching that flickering progress bar. Um, okay, so is there any is there any final final questions um, from anyone in the audience before we um, before we draw this great session to a close? Okay, all right. Well, uh, Duncan, would you mind if I jump in with a quick question? Yeah, Rob. Yeah, please. Yeah. I, I don't know if people know, but in the event that anyone has uh, a title that they have the rights to um, and they want to uh, create a virtual screening room event, we can, because it's all built within our own ecosystem, we can actually ingest titles from other people into the system if they want an event. Now, obviously, that's a, we'll need to talk about the cost of inge ingestion because that processing, you know, there is a cost associated with it. But if it's something people want to do and they're not seeing the titles they want in our catalog, but they have the rights, then absolutely jump into a conversation with us because we can ingest from anywhere and make things available to either everybody, if that's what they want, or, or just them as a specific event if they want to go down that path. So just, just to let people know that that is an option available to them with BSR. 
that's re- that's really worth knowing rob because i think you know as ellen said like a lot of that work of finding material that's very specific to to your organization can be a real audience winner so um it's really good to hear that there's more flexibility around the material okay Great. Well, um, with that, I think I might draw 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 a close to um, what we talked about today. But as I say, you know, ICO and Film Southeast are really here to help you with your sort of building up these um, these platforms and avenues. You know, we've done some work ourselves of um, taking virt- uh, screening days online, so we you know we kind of have some level of expertise, and or we can connect you with um, local people within Southeast or beyond. Um, you know, to who have taken the plunge. So. I really appreciate um, Rapinda and the, um, Rob and the rest of the Film Bank team joining us. And Ellen, thank you so much for sharing insights around the QFT player. Um, I hope to see you on some of the other calls for um, the rest of the forum. But if not, have a great afternoon and great rest of the conference. Bye, Thanks folks. Thanks very much for having us. Thank you. Cheers. Bye. Thank Bye. You.